with you tonight and grateful to God for His providence allowing us to come. We've been out to Vanderbilt University there today and passing back through. Brother Steve called me and said, uh, might be a slim chance, reckon you could come through and preach for us. And it just worked out. I mean, coming right through here about this time. And so uh, grateful to God for the opportunity and the privilege to be here. Good to see Brother Mike Crew. I'll tell you. Uh, oh, I guess it's been, what, 30 years ago you surrendered to go to Australia, something like that. I remember the service. I was there in that service. Brother Mike got up. God had been wrestling with him a long time. And uh, he, said, he said something I couldn't hear him. And I asked Brother Bearden, I said, did he say he was surrendering to go street preach? He said, no. He said he, said he was going to Australia. I said, oh, okay, okay. Uh, but I appreciate him. I was just over there. It's been about 24 days uh, in Australia with Brother Luke Highland and then Brother Phil Highland, Brother Buddy Smith, and some of those guys in the northern part of the country and covered a lot of territory. And uh, it's made me appreciate America and appreciate our heritage. You know, that country is built on uh, prisoners. So, well, America was populated by prisoners too. But I'm figuring out what happened. England poured out all the religious prisoners over here and they poured out all the reprobates over there. And uh, they're just like their grandpa, I'll guarantee you that. I preached around the world and back, and I've never been in a harder country anywhere than Australia is defiant against God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Brother Luke put out 24,000 invitations. They knocked on doors and visited, and we did too during the day, all day long. And uh, in three of the meetings, we rented halls in different towns. Uh, there wasn't one visitor out of those towns showed up, not one. And I'll tell you, it's heart-rending, it's heartbreaking. We had folk come. God saved some folk while we were there, and I glorify His name for that. But uh, from St. George all the way down to uh, uh, Tana Sands, uh, we preached and testified and witnessed of the grace of God. Had some great opportunities uh, to tell some folk about the Lord that had really never heard. God sent one fellow all the way from Japan to one of the meetings, and he had never heard Jesus, he had never heard the gospel in his life, and in one day he got to hear full, uh, three full-blown gospel messages, get his first Bible and some gospel material from Brother Phil Highland, and uh, we're praying God will save old Yoshida. Amen. And so, uh, but the Lord did some work there, but we're grateful to be back home and uh, back in the heart of the Bible Belt. And I, I know this, that it takes God to save any sinner anywhere you go. It don't matter if it's Australia or uh, right here in Tennessee. It takes the power of the grace of God to save anybody. Uh, but I do appreciate what the Lord's done and uh, the spirit of revival that's been in this land. We don't need to give up on that, folks. Just because we're in the last days. You know, 318 times the second coming of Jesus is mentioned in the New Testament. And I believe our Lord is coming, and I believe He's coming very soon. But we don't have to hobble in on a wing and a prayer. I hope so, a down and out, discouraged, Laodicean in spirit. Thank God we can have today what they've had in days gone by. And we can have an old-fashioned revival if we'll just get right with God and seek His blessed face. Amen. He asked about our ministry, and we've been in evangelism now. This is going on 35 years of laboring in the gospel of the Son of God. And uh, I figured I'd pastor a little Mountain Baptist church down around Tuxedo, North Carolina, uh, but God had other things in mind. We started out in a little gospel tent, a 20 by 30 tent, and that was some of our first evangelistic meetings, and then... Uh, the Lord let us get in some meetings that broke out and ran, supposed to go seven days, wound up seven weeks, and sinners getting saved. And uh, I found out the other day from Brother Mickey Kofer about his sister that got saved in that meeting. And Mich Mickey is a missionary in Mongolia, reaching folk that have never been reached in modern history. And God touched his heart in those meetings back there and helped him along. But uh, his sister used to drive a getaway car when they would hold up uh, the rob and rob uh, convenience stores and liquor stores and stuff like that. And old Mickey got her to come to the meeting, and she got saved. And he told me, everybody I brought over there to that meeting got saved. There's a pile of them. 
uh, folk would come in, look around, and they did take a double take. They thought they was sitting in the prison, you know, or or uh, look for the cops to come do a raid on the church or something. The Lord drew them out of the woodwork, and that started our evangelistic career. And then back in the 90s, Brother Jerry Young is going down the road one day. He heard me say on my radio broadcast, I sure do wish I could go somewhere where sinners really wanted to hear the gospel. Brother Jerry called me up and said, Do you really mean what you said? I said, What did I say? He said, You'd like to go where sinners really wanted to hear the gospel. I said, Why, sure. He said, Well, I just come back out of the, the Republic of Georgia. Me and Brother Tom Smith went down there and did a trip. And he said, Brother Andy, I'm not kidding you. When they find out you're passing out gospel literature, they'll mob you for tracks. I said, I'd like to go there because I hadn't had many folk in America mobbing me for tracks. Amen. We loaded up and went over there, and sure enough, you stand on the street corner, and any gospel literature, that lit, you wouldn't have to give it out. They would mob you, and they'd go to handing it out, hands everywhere. And we made about 10 trips to Russia in the 90s, and I sure got a taste of uh, foreign evangelism there. Uh, we'd go out in the daytime, pass out gospels and invitations, come in at night. That 1,500-seat Russian theater would be packed slap out, they would be standing room only, preach the Word of God through an interpreter, and the Lord move and have them come a hundred at a time to the platform weeping and crying, getting saved by the grace of God. God blessed, called men to preach, and I did a mighty work there. And uh, I said, you know, there's some good fishing holes in America. I went to Montana, and uh, I was back in the Beartooth Wilderness one time, Brother Steve, and I went to the head of Hell Roaring Creek. You couldn't go any further. It dried up just right above me. But I fished a little hole there, probably four feet wide and eight or ten feet long, just some swift running water. I caught 69 Yellowstone cutthroat trout on the same fly, and I just got tired of catching them out of that hole. Old, old Wesley Buzz Knight was sitting there by me. I wouldn't even tell that back here. Fellas around here say, ah, oh, yeah, 69 trout out of the same hole. You're crazy, bro. I had a witness, buddy. Amen. And I got tired of catching them out of that hole, so I just went on to change scenery. And there's places in this world where you can go and fish like that. I know we got a lot of spooky mountain trout around here, and you may not lay into them, but there's places like that. And God's let us get into a few of those regions. You know, there's hard places. I go and preach sometimes, and you'll have three or four in a hall. And the whole town reject the gospel. They need it too. And the Lord's word will not return void. And I go other places where you got uh, three, four, where well, we had 12,000 folk in evangelistic meetings in India and preached there multitudes. I mean, it was so far from the front to the back, you couldn't see the whites and the eyeballs of them dark skinned Indians. And they wasn't but uh, just about 200 seats in the place around the back. Rest of them sitting cross-legged on the ground every square foot. There's a human being, just a mass of people. I got home, looked at the pictures. There's two cars outside the tent. One of them belonged to us and one of them belonged to the interpreter. The rest of them folk rode bicycles or walked in there. Or I stopped and looked outside the tent one time and there were 69 folk got out of a grain bin and off a Massey Ferguson tractor that had rode 25 miles to come to that meeting. But my soul, what a blessing to stand and preach the gospel of the grace of God and the power of the blood of Jesus and see them turn from Hinduism and the Holy Ghost work in our hearts and see them get saved by the grace of God. I tell you, I got a heart for evangelism. Amen. Amen. And uh, what a privilege it is to go there. But we do need a touch of God here. And the same God moves there can move right here. Our problem is, I talked to old brother Percy Ray years ago. I said, Percy, tell me about those great meetings you had. He said, brother Andy, said most of them was in depression days. And he said, it was when I could set up my tent in any town in America and announce it today and have them stand in ten abreast tonight. He said people didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have anything to do. They didn't have a TV. They didn't have a radio. They didn't have a car. And he said they'd stop and take time to hear the Word of God, the Holy Ghost had moved, and God had saved by His grace. Amen. And I think one of the greatest things could happen to this nation is for a full-fledged depression to hit this country 
where gas went to about $90 a pint. Amen. And we got rationed out electricity. And folk had to stay at home and learn who their neighbors were and find out why they got a, ha- a porch on their house. Amen. And figure out who's living under the roof of their life. It'd slow us down, dog us down. Maybe, just maybe, we might look up then. I don't know. Uh, but if something don't change, we're going to find out in a hurry how folk will respond. Amen. Maybe the heat of the sun will come and they'll gnaw their tongues and blaspheme God. I, I don't know how it'll all happen, but I just want to be found faithful serving Him and living for Him. And we do ask you for your prayers as we labor and go. It's not easy on me or my wife or my family. But you know, young people, I want to say this to you. You're seeking a wife. You ask God to send you one. That's what I did. I'd been preaching about three years. I said, God, I'm not going to go run after one. You're going to have to send me one. Number one, I don't want to take time to do it. Number two, I ain't got enough sense to pick her out. So, Lord, you just show me where she's at. Donna and two other girls from Mount Sinai Baptist Church, she had got revived, full of the Holy Ghost, on fire for God. They were singing at Concord Baptist Church in Pickens, South Carolina. And uh, while they were singing, I was sitting right there on the front row getting ready to preach. And as they were singing, the Lord said, there's your wife. I said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I got around to telling her a little later on, and you know what? She agreed with me. And we've been married now 30 years, got four young'uns, and they all saved and loved God. And it's, it's a blessing to serve Jesus and uh, not have to worry about the home fires, whether they'll be burning when I get back or she'll be burning a trail. Thank God she loves the Lord much as I do, and that's what makes it all tick. Amen. And so uh, we do covet your prayers as we labor in the gospel. And brother, I appreciate you getting those Bibles out. We've got an ongoing ministry in Kenya. Got a container of literature right now setting in customs. I'd like for this church to pray about. Got a consolidator working on it. We've got to get it freed into the hands of those uh, Kenyans. Was able to buy them seven motorcycles. And those boys been going back in regions that... They haven't been able to reach. And they're like old Samson's foxes. They got their tails on fire and they're leaving a flame wherever they go. Amen. God starting churches and doing a work there. It's a blessing to be a part of that and those labors. And brother, thank you for doing what you're doing. Amen. All right. Let's turn, if you will, please, over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 23. Luke, chapter number 23. And... uh, Uh, We'll look in the Word of God this evening. I want you to stand tonight as we reverence the Scriptures together. I want you to look down in verse number 32 of Luke chapter number 23. It said, And there were also two other male factors led with him, Jesus, to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Grateful, dear God, that it does not change. Lord, appreciate the privilege to be here tonight to proclaim this message. We ask you, dear God, for liberty, grace, strength, clarity, and power to preach what you've laid on our heart. 
Father, I do pray you bless Brother Inslee this church. I pray God you'd strengthen them and Lord bless the missions and the labors of the gospel. Lord, all the other men of God and churches represented here tonight, I pray you'd send a fresh stirring and a great spirit of revival up and down this country. Oh God, how we need you in these days and how we pray for the quickening power of the Holy Ghost to revive and bring our churches out of indifference and lukewarmness and to stir our souls up toward thee. Lord, have your way now. Touch every heart. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I've studied the Word of God, I've found only one man that Jesus saved while he was hanging on the cross. Anybody that gets saved gets saved as a result of what he did on the cross. But far as we know, in these six hours... This is the only man that the Lord saved. I believe afterward Nicodemus came out of the closet and made a public profession of his faith as he embraced the Lord Jesus and he and Joseph took him and wrapped him in the linen and placed him in the tomb. I believe maybe even the centurion might have got saved after the earthquake and everything was said and done and finished. He looked up and he announced truly this was the Son of God. And another place he said, truly, this was a righteous man. I believe that old boy might have got saved. But we know for dead sure that there was one man that got saved while Jesus was hanging on the cross. We call him the dying thief. And I want to preach on that man tonight, the dying thief with a living faith. And I want to look at how God focuses in on this one man while Jesus is dying on the cross, and I believe he's using him as a focal point to say anybody that gets saved can see their reflection in how I saved this man who was a thief hanging on the cross. And the same grace it took to save me and save you is the same grace displayed and held before all the world to see when God redeemed this old rogue that died on the cross of Calvary. Now I want you to look at several things. Notice first of all the man that God saved, or the man that this faith occupied. Now we find that there were two thieves crucified. The Bible tells us that there were two. It, it says that Jesus in John was in the midst, and there was a thief on either side. And so the picture is correct of three crosses and Jesus in the middle cross. Now, which thief was on the right hand and which thief was on the left, we really don't know. We know there's a song that says the thief on the right side, you know, got saved and all that. We don't really know if he was on the right or on the left, but we do know that he was one of the thieves. You've got a man that sat there and saw everything this other fellow saw, and yet he died and went to hell. You've got a fellow on the other side that repented of his sins and got right with God, as he looked on Jesus and beheld what was going on. And that's where the division of the human race is. The same gospel I preach, I preach to all men, whosoever will, everywhere, red, yellow, black, and white, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, every age, every group of people, you preach that same message. But then you have some, the Bible says in the book of Acts, that believe, and you have some that believe not. But there wasn't anything special in this thief that calls our attention to him. What is called to our attention is the working of God in his heart. Amen. Now, there's several things said about him. First of all, he's called a thief. And both of these guys were in the same shape. The scripture said the thieves cast the same in their teeth. In other words, they were mocking him just like the world was mocking him. Just like religion was mocking him. Just like the soldiers were mocking him. These fellows were saying the very same thing. And the scripture tells us that they were thieves. They had stole something that didn't belong to them. And the Bible tells us the reason we're in the mess today that we're in is because of thievery. God created Adam and Eve, put them in the Garden of Eden in a perfect environment 
God in His graciousness gave them the privilege to eat of all the trees of the garden. A garden so big that it took three rivers to water it. A garden so beautiful that it's called a paradise. It's a beautiful place. And they had all the trees they wanted to eat of any of them. But yet the devil came along and drew attention to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God had said, don't you eat thereof. In the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And the devil came up, well, yea, God said, and began to put a question over the word of God. And then he began to put a question over God. God doesn't know the day you eat thereof. You'll be as God's, knowing good from evil. Why, God's a bad God. And Eve swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. Adam went into it with his eyes wide open. And when they reached and took that fruit and they ate it, they stole from Almighty God. The God that had given them all the trees to eat of, but they didn't keep their hands off that one thing God forbid. And because of their thievery, at that point, the human race was plunged into a fallen shape and a fallen condition. The human race has been fallen in Adam and fallen in sin ever since. You say, preacher, you believe in original sin? I sure do. I believe Adam and Eve sinned against Almighty God and every young and they had thereafter, uh, my friend came into this world with a fallen nature, a wicked nature, a nature that dead set and born against God. You say, well, preacher, I don't believe in the depravity of man. Well, if you don't believe in it, I challenge you to just go take charge of the nursery for one Sunday morning. Amen. You go back there and watch them young'uns and see how they conduct themselves. Not our young now. Don't pull that on me. It don't matter where they're at. You can put a gang of kids in the nursery and there'll be 500 toys there. And one little old girl will go over there and pick up one toy and be playing with it. And it's just like a magnet. There'll be three or four come over there and try to jerk it out of her hand. And if she won't let it go, they'll conk her on the head, pull her ponytail, kick her down, stomp her, do something. Now, did you folk teach your young'uns to act like that? Is there a mama in here that encouraged your children to be like that? Have any of you taught your children now when mom and daddy tells you to do something, you stand up and say, I ain't going to do it. And size you, be disrespectful. Did any of you teach your children that when they break something and daddy says, did you break that? To say, no, I didn't break that. I never asked. Did you teach them to lie and rebel? And to, you didn't have to. You know why? Because that old fallen nature in them is drawn to a sinful path. You may not have been there when Adam and Eve sinned, but I'll guarantee you it didn't take you long to say amen once you come into this old world because there's something warped and wicked in the heart of mankind. You say, well, preacher, at least I'm not a thief. You're not a thief, huh? You never breathed in any of God's air and turned around and used it to cuss Him with? You never have taken one of the days that God allotted you on this earth and used the energy to burn it up for your own pleasure rather than serve God. You've never taken anything that didn't belong to you as much as a glance, a penny piece of candy, a pencil you got and didn't return. You've never taken anything. I don't think there's many folk that would have the audacity to stand tonight and say, no, preacher, I'm not guilty of that one. I'm going to tell you, in all truth, we're guilty of every one of those Ten Commandments right there on the wall. And the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when I look at that thief hanging on the cross, we say, oh, that old boy needs to get saved. Yeah, but we need to get saved just as much as he did. Amen. Not only that, he's called a transgressor. And the Bible said in Isaiah 53, 12 that Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. One writer said the reason they put Jesus in the midst of the two thieves was to say this is the worst of all the transgressors. But you see, he was numbered with those transgressors. That word transgressor, uh, it means a male factor, one who works evil, one who does evil, one who practices evil. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 
that we are by nature the children of wrath. Now in this humanistic society, a lot of folk don't want to admit that. Oh, they're just a spark of good in all of us. All you got to do is just fan it and flame it, and after a while it'll burst into a fire and a flame, and, and you'll be all right. But the truth is, my friend, mankind is messed up on the inside. He's got a fallen spirit and a fallen nature that he cannot redeem, nor can he make it himself alive unto God. I was coming out of Moscow, Russia, on a, 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 on a bus, and a translator was sitting right there by me, Sergei. I witnessed to him and witnessed to him, and hey, he got tired of hearing what I had to say, and so he jumped up, ran down the bus aisle, and plopped down. He sat down by a preacher named Jeff Holloway. Jeff was out of North Carolina, just rough as a cob evangelist. And man, he was preaching in Cuba to the baseball team and all that when you couldn't get into Cuba. God opened a lot of wonderful doors for him back in the mountains of Mexico and places like that. But old Jeff, is about half asleep. Sarah Gay popped down beside him, started talking to him. And uh, in a minute here, come old Sarah Gay stomping right back down the aisle. He plopped down beside me again. He sat there all huffed up, and he looked at me, and he said, Rande, Rande. I said, what is it, Sergey? He says, what does rotten to the bone mean? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! He started blowing about how good he was and all that, and old Jeff just told him, said, your problem is you're just rotten to the bone, Sergey. I said, Sergey, it means depraved. It means wicked. He looked that word up in his English-Russian dictionary and it meant one who is evil, one who works evil, one who practices evil, one who has an evil nature. He said, yes, that's me. I am rotten to the bone. Amen. And friend, the truth is every last one of us are just like that thief. He is rotten to the bone, and that's why he is hanging on that cross. And if we got what we deserve, we'd get worse than what he got. Say amen right there. Then not only his character, but we see his condemnation. What he was and what he did got him into trouble. Now he is a thief. My sister is a career law enforcement officer. She's retired actually. Started out as a sheriff's secretary, then dealt with crimes against children and females for years and wound up in the homicide department and all of that. But I've been in and out of law enforcement. I preached their funerals and uh, been there when they've had man searches and pressures on and all that stuff. And uh, I know a little bit about thugs. And I know a little bit about how their mind operates. And I can hear this old boy say, ah, yeah. They called old so-and-so. I told old Lefty not to be robbing them banks no more. He needs to hit, hit convenience stores. Or something. I'm a little smarter than the average. Thing. They won't get me, buddy. I'm just a little smarter than they are. But he just kept on pulling the cheese out of the mouse trap till one day the Roman rat trap slapped on him and grabbed him by the wrist and said, I, 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 no more, old boy. And that Roman law overpowered him and drug him before the judge's bench. The witnesses were called. I can see them line up all down there at the prosecutor's bench. And they come by one by one. Do you know this man? My, sure I know him. That beady-eyed little weasel, I'll never will forget him. He's the one who sold my pocketbook and run off with it. That's him right there. That's him. Boy, here comes another one. Yes, sir, that's the man right there. It's old my mule went out of sight. Here's a grinning and a laughing about it. And I said, yeah, you get caught out. I'll never forget him. And one by one, they point him out and they point him out. And the more they point him out, the guiltier he becomes. And he's sort of sliding down. And the old judge looks at him. And he wraps his gavel and says, This court finds you guilty. A thievery in the first degree, you're a transgressing male factor, and I sentence you to die on the 14th day of Nisan around 9 o'clock in the morning on a hill called Calvary. You'll pay for your crimes, young man. Boy, they take him away. But you know what? I can see him in his mind thinking, Hi, ah, yeah, they got me now, but yeah, they. My buddies told me, they'll, if, we, if any of us get caught, we'll break each other out. I'll look for them to come through the door anytime. I'll get out of this mess. 
Yeah, it's a feast day. They'll, they'll drag me up the, up the road, but there'll be some of my buddies reach out and get me. And he's got, he's got something in the back of his mind that he's holding on to. He's not ready to get right with God yet. He's holding on to something. And you know, I meet sinners all over this world. And every last one of them's holding on to something. I looked a man right in the eyeballs there in Raven's Hole, Australia. And boy, he's an arrogant old rascal. And I said, you're holding on to something because if you realize you could just slip and die and go to hell just any second, you wouldn't be mouthing off like you're mouthing off. Right. Amen. But they'll do that because they're holding on to something back there, some false thought or whatever. But it's not going to be long until he starts running out of hope. You see, my friend, time's wearing on and his buddies haven't delivered him. All of the deceptions of the devil were nothing but deceptions. And Satan is a master of painting all these pictures of how it's going to be out there. But the further he goes, the darker it gets. And the more gloom settles in on his soul. And he begins to lose all hope. And as they drag him up, my friend, and stretch him out on the cross and wrestle him down and pound those nails in his hands and in his feet and rope him to that cross and lift him up that morning and let him fall in the ground with a thud and jerk all of his bones out of joint, all he can do is writhe like a worm on the cross, breathing it and trying to suck in one more breath to keep from a dying. He's losing hope in a hurry. But you know what? When a man loses hope in this life, he's getting on some good grounds because then he may want to look away from himself and look under the one that can provide hope. Not only is he a hopeless fella, he's a helpless fella. Rome see to it that he's going to get his just desserts. The law has caught up with him. The law has pinned him down. And you know when God sends the thunders of Mount Sinai and the law of heaven pins a man down, you quit hiding behind your excuses and, and opening your mouth. The Bible said that law was given that every mouth may be shut and all the world become guilty before Almighty God. You may say, well, I'm as good as that other thief over there or I'm as good as them rogues down there crucifying you. Yeah, but are you as good as God? Are you as good as His law? No, every one of us become guilty in the sight of Almighty God. And then this fellow was hurt. As he's hanging on that cross, he sees that sun rise and he knows when it goes over his head and it sets, he's going to be a dead man. It's a feast day and they won't let him hang on that cross. And if he hadn't bled to death or suffocated, they'll break his legs and he'll drop down on his chest and suffocate. He knows that his sand is about to leave the hourglass. It's pouring through. He's got just a few hours. My friend, a man realizes he's on a journey to meet death and get some help from God. We act like we're not going to die. We act like we're just going to go on and on and on. It's a 100% chance you're going to die or Jesus is going to come back and get us one of the two. And folk won't, don't want to face it. They just want to sort of blot it out of their mind. Uh, you prepare with, uh, with hospitalization for a trip to the hospital. You prepare for automobile insurance. You send your youngins to school. You get ready for wintertime, but canning your tomatoes and all that. But yet you don't prepare for eternity. Why is that? He's a hurt man. You're hurt. You only got a number of days. The psalmist said, teach us the number of our days. And how many days you got and how many days I got, I have no idea. But I know this, one of those days on that calendar is going to be your day when you go to meet God. You don't have to be sick either. And God's not going to check in with you, your mama, your daddy, the preacher, anybody else when he comes after you. It can happen in the blink of an eye. This fellow's in bad shape. But then he was hung. He was hung on that cross. But what about this providential mercy? He's hung on a cross right beside the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is nigh him. Even at his heart. One breath away. One glance. One look away. There's the Savior. The Son of God. What mercy that God would meet a wretch like that. 
But what mercy and what grace that God had meet a wretch like you and one like me. Amen. And when I look at that thief and the mess he was in, I tell you, I just see a glimpse of myself. It's a mirror in the Word of God. But then number two, I want you to look at some thoughts about the means that faith came to this man. I believe that faith comes through means. God's so big a God, if He wanted to, He could get a, a, a Katie did to come up here and play a fiddle and, and have it fiddle out amazing grace and knock everybody on their face right here in this spring ten, Tennessee community. But God didn't choose Katie did's. God chose by the foolishness of preaching. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. Amen. And if I didn't believe that God used means, you think I would burn my life out traveling this globe over telling heathens about the gospel of the Son of God? If I didn't believe God used the preaching of His Word and the testimony of His people, I'd just sit down on the stool and do nothing and do nothing. But I know this, thank God, God uses means. And you know, God's got a great arsenal in things that He can use. It don't always have to be conventional or the way I think or you think. God can get a hold of folk different ways. How'd this fella come to believe? The Bible tells us he cast the same in his teeth. The scripture tells us that they said the same thing. They mocked and they railed. But something happened to this old boy. I believe, my friend, it could have been the prayer of Jesus that shook his heart. Here he comes up that trail, and as they're nailing him, they be the Son of God, save yourself. We'll believe. Just get up from there. And they raise him up between heaven and earth. I believe these two boys is already hanging on the cross, and they got a tree stand view of what was happening to the Lord Jesus. And as they looked down there and they seen him coming up the trail, they had to say, is that a man? Well, I've never seen anybody beat that bad. Never seen anybody look like that any time in my life. Great. How's he even breathing? How's he surviving? And what's he got on his head? Is that a crown? Oh, my goodness. They've driven those big old long thorns into his brow. They've stripped him totally naked. There he is covered in his own blood. I've never seen they, what. Oh, my. Why did they just spit on him? Why did they do that? Oh, good night. I've never seen anybody treated like, I bet you he'll give them a cussing. Yes, sir, buddy, he'll give them a cussing they deserve. You know, I can't wait to hear what he says when they hang him up there. They hung Jesus up and when the cross hit the ground with a thud and dropped down, it jerked all of his bones out of joy. And my friend, pain went like hot fire through his body as his ligaments and his nerves were twisted and torn up with those old nails and splinters were driven up his back. And he lifted his head and he looked up and the old thief's got an ear turned to hear what he'd say and he can't believe it. Father... Forgive them. They know not what they do. What did he say? Oh my goodness, I can't believe that. Father, forgive them. They don't even want forgiveness. Huh. Forgiveness. Boy, I wish I could get forgiveness. I know I'm guilty as homemade sin. Look what I've done. It all caught up with me. I am guilty. Father, forgive them. Well, if a man did want forgiveness, you reckon God would forgive him? If he was offering it to them that didn't even want it, you reckon he'd give forgiveness to me? Amen. That could have been enough right there to spark faith in that old boy's heart. It was so against the norm as the sheep before shears his dove. He didn't open his mouth in his own defense, but rather he prayed and he interceded for others. Father, it's like he looked straight into the heavens. And he, he, he looked right in the straight eyes of God and called him Father. Thou be the Son of God saved. Is this the one, the Son of God? Boy, sure sound like he's got a relationship with God. Father, forgive them. They know not what the forgiveness, forgiveness, oh, that I could have. For, it could have been the prayer of Jesus. It could have been the plaque of justice. I can see that old boy as he's hanging there. On that cross, he's thinking, I wonder what this man has done. What did they accuse him of? To beat him like that, whip him like that? I can see that old boy lean out and crane his head and look at the superscription up over the head of Jesus. 
And it didn't matter if he read it in Greek, Hebrew, or Latin. It was Greek for all the folk, my friend, that were of the common language. It was Latin for all those Romans and the soldiers. It was in Hebrew for all the religious crowd, Nicodemus and all them to read. But I can see him lean out and say, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He's got time. He's hanging there on the cross. He's thinking, Man, look at the boldness of that statement. It didn't say he said he was the king of the Jews. Pilate concluded he was the king of the Jews. Thou be the king. King, king. If he's a king, they sure don't want him as king. Ah, maybe it's that spiritual kingdom I've been hearing about. Amen. Amen. Thou be the king of the Jews. Jesus of that Jesus, Jesus Savior. That's what that Savior, is he the one been saving folk? Is he the one? He saved others. Himself he cannot save. The people's jesting's adding to all of this. He saved others. Is this the one they said been saving folk? Huh, there's an old boy come running by me holding his arms up saying, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. Yeah, I used to be a leper till I met Jesus to say, Is this the one that saved that old boy? Why, if he saved him as dirty as he was, maybe he can save me. He saved others. This old boy's a thief. He knows about the most notable thug of the whole society. His name Legion. I mean, he had a reputation. They'd put him in jail and Legion had bend the bars and walk right on out. They'd rope him up and he'd break it just like it was wax. Why, he was like a Samson, but on the demonic side. Friend, they didn't have a hideout up there anymore because Legion left the graveyard and he left the life of crime. Glory to God, he went back to Gad and he unrolled that scroll and said, Repent ye, repent ye. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. Jesus, save my soul. Put me in the right mind. What he did for me, is this the one that did all that for all of these people? He saved others. Jesus, Jesus, Savior of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Boy, these truths are starting to settle in upon his soul. I don't know what got a hold of him, but something sure got a hold of him. But then I think about the magnificence of this faith. I think about how marvelous it is to see this old boy get saved. You wouldn't give him a gnat's chance of getting saved. It'd be like looking at old Timothy McVeigh stretched out on that table over there. You wouldn't even expect him to raise his head up and shout, Oh, I just got saved. No, he's, I'm the master of my own destiny. And he died in a stone-cold, hard attitude toward God and toward man. But here's this, oh, how marvelous it is. Huh. Hey, man, there's a lot of folk, if you were raised with the folk I was raised with, there's a lot of folk that were raised around me. It's still hard for them to believe I'm a preacher, much less a Christian saved by the grace of God. Oh, hallelujah. I think about him getting saved in spite of the fact there wasn't any disciples there. The disciples were dispersed. He's hanging on the cross now. Jesus is in the den of lions. And as you study that scripture, you see the soldiers were mocking him. The religious leaders were mocking him. The politicians were mocking him. The scorners were mocking him. Even the thieves had been mocking him. Satan was howling. It was like one big wolf pack around the foot of the cross, a howling and a roar. It was a roar. There wasn't any disciples standing at the foot of the cross saying, Hey, Mr. Thief, if you believe on Jesus, he'll save you. Mr. Thief, I know you're going to die, but Jesus come to shed his blood that you might. There wasn't one of them down there sicking him on. Not one. But yet he got saved. How about you tonight? How many preachers have you heard come through here beg you to get saved, point you to the Lord, and plead with your soul? This thief's going to stand in judgment against some of this crowd. Say amen right there. I think about his discomfort. He's got splinters sliding up down his back. He's got nails in his hands and feet. This old boy's groaning. He's been whipped and roughed up too. 
But yet in the midst of all of his suffering and his pain, he gets his mind on spiritual matters and he calls upon the Lord. Here you are tonight sitting on a comfortable padded pew with air conditioning, good lights, a sound system, every comfort this church can give you, and yet you won't repent of your sins and get right with God. Then I think about my friend, the depths that he discovered in a short period of time. This old boy discovered more about the Lord than a lot of folk do in the religious realm, and they claim to be leaders in the church. He discovered the Lordship of Christ. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He discovered his saviorship. He knew he had to be remembered like God remembered the children of Israel. He discovered the kingdom of the Son of God. He believed in life after death. He commits his soul unto the Lord. He believed in salvation by the grace of God alone. This old boy had some depths that came to him in those few hours upon the cross. God's going to teach this old boy some things. Then I see a manifestation of the fate's outcome. How do you know he got saved, preacher? Well, what's on the inside is going to come to the outside now. Thank God for old brother Luke. Matthew just says the thieves cast the same in their teeth. Mark says about the same thing. The only thing John says about them is they got their legs break and they died before dark. But thank God for old Luke, that Gentile physician. He said, oh, I've observed something that slipped your mind, boys. I've observed this old Gentile dog getting in. Hanging there beside you. And let me describe how it went down. Amen. Look there in Luke. He said, but the other answered him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? His buddy had just said again. He's continuing on in his mockery. If thou be Christ, save us and thyself. Now get this, get this. Both of them asked to be saved. But the Lord only saved one of them. Amen. If you be the Christ, save thyself and us. One asked improperly, one asked properly. One asked for a right motive, the other one asked for the wrong motive. One asked to get himself out of the jail, the other asked to get right with God. My friend, there's a lot of folk that may ask for different reasons, but that don't mean you get saved. Amen. But you see, whenever he called on him, there was an open confession of guilt. He looked over at his buddy and said, Do you not fear God? And evidently the fear of God had gotten this boy's heart or he had never said anything. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise knowledge and instruction. He had an open confession, my friend, of his guilt. He said, We indeed justly receive what we deserve. You fellas that preach in the prisons and the jails, it's hard to find somebody that's guilty that's in jail. It really is. I preach in a lot of prisons and jails, and I don't know at the time you have, hey, preacher, preacher, come here, preacher, preacher, come here. Do you know a lawyer? you know the judge? Oh, boy, I got shafted here. I mean, I didn't do it, preacher. I, I'm not guilty. How many of them? <laughs> oh, they don't want to admit that. Once in a while you run in, I'm guilty as homemade sin, preacher, but boy, I sure do need some help. And this old boy's quit hiding behind it. He just said, I indeed just let, I'm getting what I deserve. And oh, I remember the night when the Holy Ghost dealt with my heart under that old gospel tent. And I sat back there in a bubble of Holy Ghost conviction. And I said, I'm, I, if I die and go to hell, I'd get just exactly what I deserve. I don't deserve one thing except the judgment of God. Then my friend, he had an open correction of the godless. His buddy said, If thou be, and he was mocking Jesus, but he looked over and said, Ah, that's not right. You ought not to do that. Well, who's this bird preaching to his buddy? He'd been doing that just a little bit before. And sinners will look across, across the aisle at you and say, Who are you telling me I ought not to? I'll tell you who we are. We've been convicted of it. And the Lord showed us it's wrong, and we won't tell you that it's wrong. Amen. And then we see my friend in open confidence in Jesus. This man, he's done nothing amiss. And far as I know, in these six hours, this is the only man that stood up for the Lord Jesus Christ and said, 
He's done nothing amiss. He, there's nothing wrong with him. Hey, he's not guilty of what they're saying he's guilty of. My friend, he realized the innocency and the, that the Lamb of God was without blemish and without spot, and he gave that testimony. We don't have faith in a Christ that, my friend, uh, was born of man and woman. We have faith in the Christ who's the virgin-born Son of God, who's without blemish and who's without spot, who they couldn't pin or point any finger to and say, you're full of sin. He said, which of you convinced me of sin? This old boy came to that conclusion. Jesus Christ was the innocent Son of God. Then, my friend, there was an open cry for mercy. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now, what about that? Everybody's howling and cursing and mocking. And in front of everybody, in front of the whole world, in front of all the enemies, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. With all this roar of jesting and mockery and hatred that's being poured forth, all of a sudden, one lone voice. Lord, <laughs> woo, hallelujah. Something changed in this old boy's heart. He couldn't bow down his knees, my friend. Couldn't bow but just a little bit. But his heart sure folded up to the ground. He stuck his face in the dirt God created him out of in a spiritual way and said, I am the subject and you are the Lord. Amen. I don't care how much they attack the truth of the Lordship of Christ. You're not going to divorce it out of this Bible from sinners getting saved. You don't come to God with a balled up fist saying, I'm going to let you save me out of hell, but you're not running my life. If a man's not broken in his spirit and willing to bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he's just as bad as this other thief over here just wanting to get out of his jam, and that's all he wants. And this example that the Lord sets forth, his first word out of his mouth is, Lord, Lord, remember me. Saul of Tarsus that God made a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting cried out, Who art thou? Lord? Lord? What will thou have me to do? And you can't divorce that out of salvation. Amen. Lord, remember me. Remember me. Why did he say remember him? That's what... God said about the Jews, they were stuck in bondage and God remembered the children of Israel, raised up Moses and sent the blood of the Lamb. And he said, God, as you redeemed them, remembered them, would you just remember me? Would you look my way and have mercy upon me? When thou comest, not if you come into your kingdom, but I know you're heading somewhere and I know you're king and I know you're going to rule and reign. And I want to be a part of that kingdom. And I want you to rule over my life. I want to be one of your subjects. Glory to God, I'm a subject of the Son of God. I'm in His kingdom and He's my king. And my friend, it's, it's a blessing of my soul to be a part of His wonderful and glorious kingdom. Amen. Then I want you to look lastly at the response of the Redeemer. What did He say? You sorry, rogue you. You lived your whole life out. You stole, robbed, and broke all my commandments. You expect me to even look at you and have mercy on you. You some fool or something. That's what religion would say. I was knocking on doors down in Alabama, Roanoke, Alabama one time. Come to this house and huh, this crowd says they're all just waiting on you to come tell them about the Lord. They, they're nuts is what they are. I knocked on the door and a pit bulldog greeted me. He slobbered and blowed snot through that screen door all over my britches. That old fella come to the door. Get out of here before I turn my dog loose on you, boy. You hear me? I don't know this religious Jesus stuff. I said, you have a good day, sir. Eased on off the porch, went to the next door, knocked on the door. Come in. I said, anybody home? Yeah, come in. I went in. It's an older man and woman sitting there both of them on oxygen in their little old living room. 
And as I began to talk to them, tell them who it was, preaching a meeting there in a the little old church and all that, they broke out crying. And I said, what you crying for? I said, well, I said, I said, we've been church Christ all these years. I said, our preacher just come by. He told us we was no count, no good for nothing. We all broke down. He said he wasn't, he wasn't no good to the church, God, and nobody else. He didn't have no use. And they just started squalling. And he said, he just has left. I said, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. And I pointed them to this old dying thief. Both them old folk bowed their head right there and called on the Lord and begged God to save them by His grace. And I'm going to tell you the response of Jesus. What you saw a low down road gear? He looked over at that man that sincerely had repented of his sins, changed his mind toward the Lord, called upon him and begged him for divine grace and it got a response out of Jesus in all of his agony, all the pain. He's becoming sin and self-judged of heaven and earth, the upper and the nether grinding stuff or grinding him, but he stopped. What got his attention was, Lord, remember me. Jesus turned and looked at him and said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Boy, God's got a whole lot of burdens running in this universe. And all the things that are going on, he's still running it, by the way. Amen. But you know what will stop God dead in his tracks? Hallelujah for some poor old sinner to get on their knees and cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. It'll stop all heaven from all the activity that's going on that God might reach down and save your soul by His amazing grace. Woo! Hallelujah to His name. Notice He said, Verily, that's indisputable. You won't argue with this. I say it's imperial salvation. Yeah, I can hear them mockers, and it don't record it, but I'll guarantee you that. Ha! Who does he think he is getting saved? Ha! He thinks Jesus can save him. Did you hear that? I'll guarantee you they mocked him. But my friend, what Jesus said was imperial because it was the decree of the king. They weren't going to alter it. And I don't care what religion says about me or you, they're not going to alter what God has done in my soul. It's settled for time and eternity. He said, I say unto you, there was an interchange there. Thank God Jesus has given that guy salvation and he's taken off of him his sins. Today, it was immediate salvation. He didn't say, well, fella, if you can hang on now for another six or eight or ten hours or maybe you can wiggle off that cross and get down there and get baptized or maybe start tithing or become a member of the church, then I might consider letting you into the kitten. No, immediately, glory to God. I believe in immediate salvation. I believe you can come into this place a lost, hell-bound sinner and go out of here leaping and jumping for joy on your road to heaven. That's what happened to me immediately that night when the Lord transformed and saved me and regenerated me by His grace. Woo, hallelujah. Then He said, today shalt, that's immutable, it's not going to be changed, shalt thou, it's individual, be, that's infinite. You're not going to cease to exist. You're going to be forever and forever and forever with me. It's eternal. Be with me. Emmanuel's my name. God with us. We'll never be separated from this point on. It's an end salvation. In uh, paradise, I'm in Christ Jesus. And then it's an inherited salvation. You're going to be with me in paradise. The Lord, when he bowed his head and heart, he went down into the heart of the earth, into the paradise of God. Luke 16 tells us hell is on one side, paradise is on the other, and a great gulf fixed between. And my friend, those thieves had their legs broke, and Jesus just reached back up with his long arm of grace and got that old boy, and whew, here they came. There's old Abraham. Here he comes, boys. Praise God, there's old Jeremiah. Isaiah not sawed asunder but with a body glorifying and a shouting and who's this he got with it? It's the first trophy of grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's an end salvation in paradise. It wasn't there something? The first thieves got kicked out of paradise in Genesis chapter number 3. Right. But now the Lord said, put your flaming swords up, cherubim. Praise God, my blood has paved the way into the holiest. The law of God is satisfied. This old boy's been cleansed and made whole, and I'm bringing him back in, glory to God. Amen. 
I'm glad I got an inheritance in him. Not just saved, but I got an inheritance forever and forever and forever. Invitations twofold tonight. Number one, if you got a dying thief in your life, don't you give up hope. I don't know anything about the history of this man and God don't tell us about it. He may have had a praying mama or a grandma or somebody that witnessed to him along the way. We don't know about all that, but I know this. I've got a lot of rogues in my life that are stubborn as this old boy, but I don't have a right to give up. Long as they got breath in their body, God's on the throne. I don't know where that line is. I have no idea. Only God does. Don't you give up. You say, well, I've inv- I'm just going to quit inviting. I'm not saying nothing else. Don't do that. Don't do that. Praise God. Keep praying. Keep pleading. Keep calling on the Lord for them. And in the hour when you least likely think they might get saved, that might be the hour that they get under conviction and get right with God. And then number two, if you're here tonight lost and undone without God, What God did for this old boy, God can and will do for you. If you repent of your sins and call on the name of the Lord Jesus and beg Him to save you, God can save your soul just like He saved this old boy. What a powerful gospel. I'm not ashamed of this gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's stand tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed. Brothers, getting us a song. Sister, if you'll come on the piano. Number 305. We're going to sing tonight, but if God spoke to you, you might need to get saved this evening. Just like that old thief, your time's running out. Jesus is coming. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, oh, come beg God to save you. Maybe you got somebody on your heart. The Lord just lets you see a picture and He's put a fresh burden on your soul. Maybe you won't just come bring them to the Lord. God, there's no hope with man. But I'm not looking to man. I'm looking to you tonight, Lord. I, I want to call on your name. And whatever it takes, God, as you brought that old point, that old boy to the point of repentance, God, I pray you'd work in them. Don't give up on them. God, I'm not going to give up on them. I'm going to keep praying. Let's sing it out now. You won't come join these praying. You come on as we sing.